Roy is the hero. He, he came out with a short version which recaps. You can show you the video towards the end uh, or tweet it. And I've been retweeting that for like four years every, for every DevOps because it's a good reminder of the event. Yeah. Okay. Cool. What are you up to? Uh, I'm busy, Manny. Yeah? I'm busy, training busy. my model. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, what are you doing? What, what are you using to train your model? I what mean, I frameworks are you using? I don't know which library is the best. So I'm using I, absolutely all of them. I say take all of them, pile them on one top of each yeah, other. Yeah. Usually gives good results. Absolutely. Yeah. And Let's as, try that. Yeah. And as I can see, I'm using machine learning. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Like now I'm trying to some deep learning stuff. Perfect. Quite, quite serious. Perfect. Let's, let's see what, what's happening. Oh, absolutely amazing. Yeah. Great results. Can, I mean, pretty happy with that. 99%. I told you, right? Increasing the epoch, rerunning the trainings. Always yeah. gives good results. Uh, after 200 uh, epochs, it works so well. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, yeah. why didn't you get 100%? But anyways, I don't let's know. It's, it's good enough. I think yeah, it's yeah, good yeah. enough. Yeah. Let's, 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 let's see. If, let's see, if, on the test let's see what happens on the actual result. Wait. Ah, what? 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 Manny, what have you done? Okay. Somebody had to be present to debunk the model. Y yeah. Yeah? yeah. Somebody had to come and be uh, like, you know, present here to show that the model actually doesn't work. But you I, put a lot of yeah. hard work in it, I know. No, but I don't understand. It was working perfectly fine on chicken before. Exactly. And I yeah. showed up here and we now know that the model doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, what's yeah. going on? Yeah. 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 Right. Well, you know what right. I say? We need to admit. We, have we don't no know already. what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. We really don't know what's going on. Yeah. All right. Go. Right. right. Su suit yourself. Suit yourself. <laughs> So that brings us to the question, do, do we, we really, really know, know our data? data? <laughs> so this introduction was um, uh, an illustr barely exaggerated illustration of our struggles as developers turning toward data science. So, yeah, yeah. so this presentation is about trying to get things right from the beginning and preventing you from falling in the same traps. Cool. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to this event. I know it's uh, it's really early, nine o'clock. Most of all sleep like really till ten o'clock. But thank you for being here and taking your time and being here. Um, as as Jeremy said, uh, for the next forty odd minutes, we'll be talking about this topic, and you'll see how we explore through some of the, the problems and suggest solutions. So let's get started. Oops, sorry. So a little bit about myself. So I'm a freelance software developer. In my day job, I join teams, strengthen them up, help them ac accelerate, uh, primarily working the Java JVM platform, but I also do other programming languages. So I kind of call myself a polyglot developer. Uh, lately, in the last year or so, I've taken a lot more interest in AI, ML, and the family of concepts. Uh, so, and that's why this talk uh, on data science. Um, and you can find a lot of my other details there if you follow me on Twitter and other stuff. Um, so, Jeremy, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? So, I wish I was a rocket scientist, but I'm not. I'm sorry to disappoint. So, I'm the co-founder and CTO of a small startup called Trackerner. We do a sort of a Fitbit for horses, um, zero stuff. And I'm also the co-host of a machine learning study group, uh, which was born in the Meta Mentor community. So, I started like, learning data science a couple of years ago and started applying it in my company in the past year. So we put these slides live, so I suggest you take a picture of it or take the QR code, um, make a note of the URL, and there's a folder once you go onto the URL, and in the folder there's, there are these slides which are PDF files, so a little bit of a treasure hunt, but I highly recommend, uh, so we'll wait a few seconds for you to get there because we'd like everybody to like follow with us so you don't fall behind. So let us know when you've taken pictures of this and have, uh, have it recorded so that we can move on from here. I'm good. Okay, should we go yeah. further? Thank yeah. you. I mean, we can always come to this slide if at all you need the, the, the link. So, um, as you know, this has been a really overwhelming experience for both of us, uh, and a an humbling one as well, because we were really overwhelmed with, uh, when we started uh, preparing for this presentation, it was nearly, today marks the fourth month of us working together on this talk. And we were really overwhelmed with a lot of information. As you can understand, data science, machine learning, AI is, is a huge topic. And uh, we, had, we made a lot of decisions. We changed our decisions. We went back and forth. We agreed, disagreed. And, uh, so, and we're going to be sharing this experience with you. And, and we tried our best to condense 
as much as we could all of that information into an understandable, into an understandable form and concept. Uh, and so let's see what we have uh, for you. Um, we couldn't have done this without the help of a lot of these people and more, and most of these are very renowned professionals in the industry, well, in the area of data science, statistics, uh, machine learning, and they actually helped us vet a lot of the, our concepts, our structure, our co content, uh, and we went back and forth getting feedback from them, uh, and then you can already uh, see that they're all coming from renowned uh, sources. So big thanks to them, especially to your mentor, Mark, who, in fact, it was his mentor who instilled the idea in, into, uh, his, into his head and then he passed it on to me that actually, before you do machine learning, please have a look at your data, understand your data. Mm. Um, so given, given our credentials, as you can see, um, everything and anything we say today, just now, you want to take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> don't take it literally, don't go home and do all the stuff or go to work and do the stuff we are saying to you. Please apply your critical thinking as well. Um, and with that, I'd like to also add a disclaimer that um, our journey may be different from yours. Um, and, and this is our first attempt on this topic at a DevOps uh, event. So it is definitely going to have uh, inaccuracies and mistakes and uh, errors, um, simply because we are sharing our learning experiences with you. Um, and th this is something we gathered, thoughts and ideas we gathered in the past year or so. So it's, it's fairly rough and new. Um, and mostly I will say these are guidelines. They are not set in stone. It's not a silver bullet. doesn't mean what we say here is what works. And you need to go and try it out on your own and use your own thinking about it. Um, and, and lastly and most important, if something isn't clear, it probably is our fault. Please tell us or please ask <laughs> us or give us feedback uh, constructively so we can fix it so that the next uh, uh, session can be a better one. And plus, the, we apply the feedback back into the slides and the resources. So when you look at it later on over the weekend or next week, you see the correct version. So uh, when you think about what is involved in solving a machine learning problem or solving a problem with machine learning, do you, does it make sense to you? Does it feel like the time you would spend in each of those activities? Are these figures correct? So raise, raise your hands if you think these numbers are correct. OK, I see two nods. <laughs> there are no other, there are blank places somewhere else. It uh, <laughs> doesn't matter. You, you don't have to be right or wrong. So whoever thinks it's correct, uh, <laughs> we are going to debunk your assumptions. <laughs> so as you can see, when you look at before, after, the red orange being about actually training the model, it's in reality only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there is a lot which comes before about data analysis, cleaning, and features engineering. And this is what we're going to talk about in this session. Yep. So we also want to be very clear of the things we don't cover, simply because, so, because it's a vast topic and we can't just do everything in, on, on, in, under the uh, hood here. Um, so we, don't, we are not doing time series data sets. We are not doing computer vision and unstructured data sets. We are not, doing, we are not generating synthetic data. Uh, well, all we're covering is tabular data, rows and columns. Simple, just we want to keep it simple. And the example we have is all numeric columns. So that makes it even simpler. But the principles and the ideas and the guidelines we're sharing, they are very uh, universal and agnostic. And hopefully you can apply them all across the board. Of course, there'll be exceptions in some cases. But then it's just to go and figure out what those exceptions are. So we have an agenda here. You want to tell us, Jeremy, yeah. uh, what are we going to? So we're going to talk about those different steps. So data collection, data analysis, data preparation and cleaning, features engineering. And then we'll conclude on what of us do on all those big frameworks uh, around those different things. Cool. Uh, we have a lot of resources as well towards the end. And there's an also an appendix section in the, in the slides. I mean, it's probably unusual to see an appendix in slides. but. We have that in ours. Um, so, um, Jeremy, yes. tell us. So we're trying to make it like data visualization driven uh, because we think it's the best way to see things, to understand things uh, with images. And it's also trying to instill critical thinking. We'll be asking questions that you might want to ask yourself when you work on that kind of project. Yeah. So as I said, mentioned earlier that uh, there might be some answers, but we try to put more questions and puzzles into this into the uh, presentation so that you can use those questions and answer your own questions, or come more come up with more questions which will give you more answers and then help you further in the investigation rather than just getting answers and thinking, oh, though the are these the only answers, and then you know, not not really broadening your horizons. 
So okay. let's start. What is data collection? Yes, so what is data collection? So data collection is the process of uh, gathering um, uh, information and measurements on targeted variables uh, in order to answer relevant questions and to also evaluate outcomes of a problem statement or an or a, or a objective uh, or, or a query. Okay. So, Jeremy, this looks really interesting, this, this, uh, this whole slide here. It's got a lot of these insects on it. Can you tell us a little bit about it? What's it about? Yeah, in, in, my, in my past experience, I learned a lot about bugs, okay. especially with my legacy code. Mm -hmm. so I that goes with your title, right? Yeah. Uh, CTO. Self-inflicted. Self-inflicted CTO self of a startup. Yeah. So, let's, let's, let's collect some data about bugs. Let's, let's try to label them and, and collect those data. So I did some work. Yeah, yeah. Can Let's see what, what you did. Oh, levels. okay. Interesting. But I'm, yeah. I'm sure everybody else, including me, will notice that there are a couple of labels there that kind of don't go with the names of the bugs, right? They're like, I mean, aren't, they, aren't they names of music bands here, yeah, even though they pure, sound like... Pure coincidence. Okay, okay. So pure coincidence. Yeah, I mean, but to be honest, I didn't collect those bugs myself. Of My course. customers did of that course, for me. Yeah. So there were different sources. We didn't agree all on the same standards. Yeah. And we get with like a data set with errors, with mislabels. Mm -hmm. So it's so a perfect example for mislabeled data set. Yeah. It, uh, also dirty says, data. it also says a little bit about your customers, their <laughs> inclination to music. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. So. Uh, some questions to ask. Yeah, so what, what are the questions we ask? So um, in the pro during the process, even, and, and while you're doing the process, or even before the process of data collection, you want to ask yourself certain questions, right? What are your requirements? What's the goal you're trying to meet? Um, and, and then did you have enough details that you require in order to proceed further from here before you say your data collection process is finished? And it's often important to know, do you have enough data? And maybe you may not have the answer immediately, but it's important to understand that this is a question you want to ask again or, or think about. Um, and or, or one of the things we kind of forget a lot of times is, is our data reflecting reality? Or is it just, just random set of columns put together by somebody and, they, and somebody else in the marketing team or in the management wants some results out of it? Uh, and highly uh, likely, we might be forgetting about it or not knowing what to do about it is, and it's very important these days is to ask, is the data set biased? Is the data that we've collected biased? Uh, and what the bias is and things like that, and we'll see that further from here. Uh, most importantly to remember is data collection is actually part of an iterative process. So it's not just that you do it once and you forget, it's part of the iteration. When you hit the, bottom, uh, the end, end, last step, you come back and question again, do I need to collect more data? So let's, um, let's go further and see. And I would even add, like, if the data you're collecting, um, is, it, is it is going to be the same as the one you'll have in production? Or is there a bias? Is there a difference? And sure. you might have okay. to address that. Sure. So um, we come, we, that brings us to the exploratory data analysis, which is the next step. And the exploratory data analysis is the process in which you are actually um, creating summarize, summaries of the main characteristics of your data set. Um, and sometimes, and a lot of times, in fact, a lot of times, this involves uh, visualization methods. So you basic, basically make a lot of graphs and plots of those summarized data uh, aspects of your data set. And, and, and actually, this is the early stage or early stages of getting to know your data. This is where you get the feel of what your data is that you've collected in the previous steps. So let's so, see what are the uh, so first the question topics. is do you I mean the, the different topics is about getting to know the domain knowledge because you want to understand a minimum that you're going to work on. Then we're going to see that in more details uh, in a notebook. Uh, it's about checking the basic characteristic of a data set, um, see the rows, then check the descriptive statistics, the minimum, maximum, mean. Then start plotting where you start learning a lot about it. We can start with distribution of every feature and then look at the correlation between the features and the features with a target column. Cool. So um, uh, this is one thing, right? Critical thinking means we need to ask the question, why? Why are we doing exploratory data analysis, right? We could just skip this and go on to machine learning and training, right? So what are the reasons we could be doing? Um, because maybe we think we're working with a black box and we don't want to be working with a black box. We want to know what, what the deeper aspects of, of, of what we're working on is. A lot of times we could be feeling a bit lost 
about what we're working on, on the data set or the, or the model itself. And, and it's important to know why we're doing that and to also be more better prepared because as we go through the journey towards the machine learning uh, aspects and then look at the results, uh, and if the results are this way or the other way, we need to be well prepared to know why the results are going in a certain direction. And so, so it's the exploratory process helps you prepare yourself to that point. Obviously, you don't want to waste a lot of time, right? and then come to a conclusion of a certain type, that means you've done the wrong, you made the wrong decisions. And, and most importantly, you're doing this to achieve a goal. And so the exploratory process is important so that you, you, you stick to the goal and you stay to the goal and you don't uh, tangent from it. And, don't, and if, you, if you course correct, you don't go away from the goal. So the exploratory process helps you stay stable. So, uh, Jeremy, can you show us, um, or maybe I can actually you show. You do this one. Yeah, why don't I show you how that goes? So we have a we have a set of notebooks that we are sharing uh, with these slides, and you'll see them as links on your slides if you open them up. Um, they have a standard structure all across the board. Uh, so the top section of the notebooks are always narrations about the notebooks or the steps uh, involved. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, the steps involved to be safe. And um, and, and then there is a set of resources as well at, in the, uh, that you can look into for a further deep dive. And then we have s expansions of each of the steps that we cover. So we are looking at exploratory data analysis. Um, and that means that we will cover a whole number of things. And because it's an important topic, we've decided to cover pretty much everything that's there in the notebook. But we'll go at a pace that is not too slow or too fast in the interest of time. <laughs> So as we mentioned earlier, we have a whole section domain knowledge, which actually will kind of you know, want to ask yourself, do I know enough about the data set? Do I know enough of the domain where the data set's coming from? Um, and then once you have the data set, you want to get a feel of the data set. So in the form of a notebook, what you do is, in this case, we, we are working with the Boston housing data set. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with this. Um, so what we did is we, we downloaded the data set. It's a zip file. We un unzipped it, and then we opened one of the CSV files. You can see there's a bunch of CSV files and, and another uh, text file. Uh, we, in this case, we used Python but you could use another programming language, and the concept will be the same. Um, and so luckily with this data set, we have some uh, narration with the data set, so it, it tells us a little bit about what the data set is about, where it's from, um, and it gives us things like the names of the attributes or the columns uh, that are in there. There are 14 of them. Of the, that, 13 of them are features, and you can see the last one at the bottom here, which is MEDV, which is actually the, it's, it's the mean value of the owner owned occupied homes. It's like the house price in, in, a certain, in a certain sector. So that's not your feature. That's your target, right? Um, I do want to make a small correction here. You see two of these sex, uh, fields here. One of them says name, number of instances, five or six. And the other one says machine attributes, none. There is a bit of a correction on that. I will come to that later on. Because uh, the Boston housing data set, mostly available on the internet, is a clean data set. It doesn't have any missing values. It doesn't have any errors. It does have outliers in them. But that's not good enough to do, to practice or learn how to do to clean a data set. So we, for, for that, to illustrate and demonstrate that process, what we did is we created an unclean data set by adding 50 more uh, um, unclean records and 50 duplicates. And you'll see in the next stages where her, so the numbers might look like a bit off, but they're not off, they're deliberate. Uh, and, and you'll see that when we start cleaning the data set, the numbers will come back to the original clean data set. So coming back to getting familiar with the columns, um, now when you get a data set like this and you've seen those columns, I mean, in fact, um, let's go back to look at the columns. Um, you, you would then start uh, developing or coming up with hypotheses about the data set, right? Because there are positive uh, attributes of the data set and negative attributes of the data set. And the positive attributes will have a positive impact on the target. And the negative will have a negative impact on target. So it's good to have your hypothesis. And the hypothesis is just an assumption. It may be correct or wrong, but you're going to go ahead and try to prove it right or wrong. And so if you look here, we've already kind of uh, filtered out a number of fields we think that will have a positive impact on the housing price, and, and the number of them we think might have a negative impact on the housing price. And then it's for us to do the analysis to find out which way it's going. And that's what we're going to do here. So as part of the exploratory process, we're going to also look at the uh, attributes of the data set. So you can see over here the, the shape of the data set. It's got 606 rows. 
and 14 columns, which you know is obvious from the previous data above. And then, then the next step we would do is have a little bit of a peek into the data set. So we look at like a sample first 10 or 20 records of the data set. So we do a head of it. And, and then looking at the columns, we can already see like they're all numeric columns, right? It's, 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 it's no brainer to, to deduce that. And some of the columns, they appear uh, to be values between certain numbers. Uh, some of them are more fractional. The other ones look more like whole numbers. Like if you look under the rad column, it's 1.0, 2.0, and all that. Uh, under age, it's, it's, it looks like it's more like a percentage. Uh, but we will look into that further. And those are the things to look at and, and pay attention to, again, when the data set is provided to you. And then you want to look at all the data types. Now, in this case, we are lucky. We've been given a data set which are, everything is numeric. So unlike if you have a data set with mixed columns, which you can have. But in this case, we're lucky. It's numeric. So again, uh, the effort is different. Um, the, going, going further, if we then look at the, the descriptive statistics, which uh, Jeremy was mentioning earlier, is uh, the descriptive statistics is really handy. What it does is it summarizes the whole data set and gives us very high level information about uh, what's the mean value of certain columns, what's the standard deviation, what's the maximum value, what's the number of uh, rows in the data set for that column that has values. That means you can already see there are missing values, null values in that column. Uh, you can already see what's the maximum minimum of values in that column, what might the outliers be. And you can see the quartiles, which are fairly interesting and important, like the 25%, 50%, and 75%. And then from this here, we can see that the previous conclusion we made about age may be right, because uh, the minimum maximum is between 0 and 100. Uh, and and uh, the rad column, uh, looks like they are whole numbers. And, and, and they may not be percentages, but they might be, in my conclusion, what we thought, that they might be um, in, in de indexes or integer labels. Again, this, this is to be found out, because they are not fractional values. Um, and then earlier, uh, Jeremy mentioned we plot these distributions, which is more interesting, because the descriptive statistics is summarized, so it's not too much detail, but a distribution uh, of the, uh, a plot of the distribution is really handy because you can you can see the you can see a bird's eye view of the whole thing. It's you can see the minimum maximum. You can see the gaps between the minimum maximum. You can see like for example columns like zone uh, chas which stands for Charles River um, and Lstat and the last one which is here uh, the the B column. They have these gaps in between. There's a mix there's a, probably a maximum on one end and a minimum on the other end. And then it's interesting to find out what is the reason for these gaps. Um, and then this also opens up uh, questions about, oh, uh, like for example, in my case, when I was looking at the Chas uh, River and the Rad column, if you see there are gaps in between the two. And so I was wondering what is that? First of all, I was wondering what that column was about. So what I did is I opened up the map of Boston. See, this is a part of an exploratory process to get to know more about the domain. So I opened up the map of Boston, I could see Bounded by river, because that's what the field means. Houses that are bounded by river are actually the houses that are within the Charles River that looks like it's bounded by the river. So that's what it means, because sometimes words may not describe what the column is about, so visuals may. And then the rad column, I was wondering, what is this index of, uh, it's like these highways that, that are built outside the river. And when you look at the map, you can see all the highway interconnections are on one side. You have the river in the middle, and you have all the other houses on the other side. And now it's clear the rad is like all those index numbers of the entry points of the, of the highways. And maybe they are isolated from the houses that are on, on bounded by the river, and that might have an impact on the housing price or not. But these are all giving you extra cues and extra information. Had I not looked at the map, I would have stayed confused and made incorrect conclusions. So that's an, it's an interesting exploratory process. So let's go further and see. Um, what else do we do? Um, like, for example, let's look at uh, Correlation. correlations. So that'll be a bit towards the end of, the, of this notebook, is um, we have a scatter plot of, uh, of every field with the, with the uh, target price. And again, these will give you more information about outliers, maximum, minimum, the, the, the distribution, uh, and, and things like that which will again help you make some more conclusions. It was also going to help you to see which are really correlated. When you look, for example, at the number of rooms, 
there is an obvious correlation, like yeah. very linear. You have some others which are a bit more complex, like criminality. Uh, and you have some others, like, there doesn't seem to be any correlation in just, like, whatever <laughs> the, the, the age of uh, yeah. so uh, the prices can be anything. So the hypothesis that we made earlier of positive, uh, of the things that have a positive impact or a negative impact, or no again, impact. now you can cross-check that co hypothesis and get a little bit more confidence Oh, okay, I made a proper hypothesis because I can see the room number of rooms has, and logically speaking, if a house has more number of rooms, it's illogical to see the house price being lower than the ones that have, you know, higher number, less number of rooms. So, but the other ones, then it's arguable and it needs probably more research to find out why is it higher or lower or is it really having an impact on the housing price. Um, further down is it's really interesting to see a correlation matrix which actually does uh, N, N by M, which is it takes every field with every field, including the target price, and it, and, and it checks what is the correlation between them. And you can see from the graph then the values that are positively, uh, uh, the, the values that are positive uh, are actually having a direct or a positive impact on the, on the housing price, whereas the values that are in the negative zone are having an inverse impact on the housing price. And the ones that are close to zero are the ones that have no impact on the housing price. And when you look at this, especially the last row, you can already see like the columns that ha have a positive or a negative impact or actually are not impacting the housing price. This is inf useful information because this will give you clues to your next step, which may be feature engineering, or maybe you know, helping you making your data set more compact. So that's, that's your exploratory process in a nutshell. Of course, you would do more detailed stuff in your case, and, and I would encourage you to do that. But more or less, this is where we want to, what we want to show you. Do you want to show us the next step, uh, Jeremy? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, so first, the question we're going to ask about this is, do I know my do the domain knowledge? Do I know what I'm looking at? Does it make sense to me? Do I know where my data come from? Uh, and how those data was gathered together? Oops, sorry. Uh, um, is there any bias that I can already see in it? Are there dirty data? And if there are, can you spot problems? And what can I fix? What should I work on in the next step? So the question. exploratory process is also where you earmark certain columns in certain situations and decide whether you fix it, you remove it, you fill it with something, or you ignore it. Again, we did certain things, but doesn't mean in your case you have to do those certain things. You have to make an informed decision about those columns to find out is that something you would do in your case. And we'll talk more about it when we show the data preparatory data preparation notebook. Um, yeah. Um, one thing to, to know is that correlation not equal to causality, be, not because you have uh, two features which are correlated, but one is the reason of the other. Yeah. Uh, here I'm sure we having a, a video that we won't show here, but that I invite you to check. It's from a very serious course called Calling Bullshit that you can find on callingbullshit.org, which is a course from an American university and on critical thinking. Is, has anyone heard of that? Okay, so it's a good one to explore and find out because this is another thing, we, a toolkit we added for critical thinking. Like, the, don't buy the correlation matrix just because it looks nice and it <laughs> may, may look correct. You know, we want to question it. So find out how that works. Um, actually, um, so yeah. with that, actually, we want to take you to a, a stage where we think, uh, we think that comedians know their data. And so let's spend the next 55 seconds to find out why we think that. So that's going to be Ellen telling us or showing us something. Thanks so much. Welcome to the Oscars. Uh, for those of you watching around the world, it has been a tough couple of days for us here. It has been raining. <laughs> We're fine. Thank you for your prayers. I am happy to be back. I hosted seven years ago, and I am so honored and flattered that they have me back so quickly. so different now. Uh, last time, for instance, when I was here, Kate Blanchett was nominated, Meryl Streep was nominated, <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio was nominated, Martin Scorsese was nominated. So different. <laughs> there are some first-time nominees here tonight. June Squibb is nominated for Nebraska. Cool, 
that's, that's about we're going to show. You can watch the rest of it yourself. Um, and so if you've noticed, Ellen knew her time series. <laughs> she knew her graphs. She made her laugh. That means she did know information and data about the audience she was facing. And she didn't have enough time for data collection. But she was prepared. Okay? So that brings us to data preparation, a, a good state. So data preparation is a process in which you manipulate raw data and bring it to a stage which will help you do more accurate data analysis and probably more accurate feature engineering and then help you create a better model. So what we're, looking, we're going to look at is basically what we've learned during data analysis and start dealing with it. So we're going to deal with errors in our data, duplicates, outliers, missing data, and we might also start dealing with the fact that we have too much data, like too many features or um, too many rows. So, so we'll ask this question again. Why are we doing data preparation? So we, there's this old ad adage, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And that's like no-brainer to understand. Uh, also, we want doing data preparation to create a clean data set. We want a cleaner data set or clean data set so that we know that the machine learning model we'll create reflects nature's model. What we mean by nature's model is in every model, in every data set, there are true values that are hidden in there. And it's, it's our job to go and find out and investigate that. Now, if you're in the, about the, you are from the Bayesian thinking, you will know what true model means or what, what uh, nature's model means and what true values mean. There's a link there to follow um, and investigate further what nature's model means. So sh uh, can you show us a little bit, uh, Jeremy, what we would do during the data preparation stage? Oh, oh. Yes. So, um, Okay, so I'm going to show you now uh, about data preparation. So this notebook, like the others, is following the same structure. Uh, and in this case, we're going to focus on outliers and missing data. Um, yep. Yes, right yeah, there. okay. So, um, what we're going to do is that, let's suppose that we have a feature which follow a bell curve or normal distribution. Uh, the outliers are going to be the extreme values which are on one side of the other side of this distribution. So, uh, like those orange values in here and here. And you, here we're going to show a very simple way to deal with it, just ignoring them. But you might want to do something, uh, maybe those data are genuine and you might need to, to keep them. So it's something that you need to check, are those outliers genuine or there are error in the data collection or issues we need to, to fix. So uh, in that case, uh, simply like ignoring them, what I would do is that uh, I'm going to work on the number of rooms and I'm going to use a simple um, uh, condition when I'm going to remove everything which is above the mean, which would be the middle here uh, in that normal distribution, plus two standard, two standard deviation. So it would be everything here and do the same on the other. Yeah. On so the all, other the values, all the values on the either sides of two times the mean are the no, ones. The standard deviation. Two, sorry, two times the standard deviation. Well, it's, it's, mean, mean. it's mean minus and plus two times standard deviation. We think those are the outliers, and then we will drop them. And then we'll, you can see in the graph here that yeah. kind of gives you the, the, the distribution of values that we think are the ones that we want to use that are within the, within the yeah. uh, accepted region. And as you can see, it's, uh, we just remove uh, the extremities. Then we're going to, to work with missing data. So as, uh, as Mani mentioned earlier, we added missing data in the, the data sets. So first thing is to look at them, to see them. And then to, we can use some simple uh, function from pandas, if we're using Python, to drop the, the non values, so the, those missing values. And in the end, we check that, we have no missing values anymore. Um, and we drop the rows with missing values, and we drop 50 rows. So as, Again, you, yeah, as you saw that um, the numbers come back to 5 or 6. It was 6 or 6 earlier because we had 50 uh, uh, missing rows and 50 duplicates. And so when we drop them, it's come back to its original uh, value. Again, you, here we're doing the most simple thing to just drop the rows. But you might want to do something else with that. You might want to fill the gaps 
with uh, more um, relevant, re relevant data. Like you could use the mean uh, of the data, you could fill it with zeros, or whatever transformation makes sense in that, in that case. So okay. both the outliers and, and, and missing data, you've got to make informed decisions about them because they are actually signals to tell you there's something wrong in your data set or you need to do more investigation. Okay. Cool. Let's uh, move forward. So the question to ask is, uh, again, do I have outliers? Do I need to work with it? Uh, do I have missing data? Do I have class overloads, which is I would have a, a category uh, column with labels, and do I have like many, many different labels, and I need to group them together? Do I have too many features, uh, and what can I do with it? Uh, do I have an imbalanced data set? Like, do I have uh, one label I'm going to classify which has most values, and labels which have very, very, very fewer values? Uh, again, I'm a data biased, and if it's the case, do I need more data? Do I need to come back to data collection to gather more data? I mean, you need to understand what the bias is and, want how, and, and make an informed decision. How are you going to deal with it, or is it okay? And, how, and if it has an impact, positive or negative, on what you're trying to do. Cool. So that brings us to feature engineering. So feature engineering is a process of actually um, extracting the essence of the data set. Uh, and, um, and, and, and making, basically making the data set more compact so that we, you, we are able to efficiently create the model uh, and then hopefully that model will produce more accurate results given that we've, all the, we've done all the previous steps correctly and we've checked and cross-checked. So that's uh, feature engineering and we'll see further from here what the, what the topics would be there. So yeah, uh, why don't you tell us, uh, Jeremy, what what we are covering in feature engineering. If that still works, okay. Um, so what we're going to look at, there are many things you can do in features engineering. Uh, it's almost an art. It's not like a list of bullet points you need to go through, but you, you, with experience, you'll find out what works best with your, with your data sets. And this is a list of things that we find interesting to, to, to check. So you're going to transform and create features in that process, and why, and we you do that to find hidden information. So you could do feature extraction. For example, you take a date and you extract the month because you think there's a periodic um, trend in your data. You could apply maths and statistical functions, like we're going to see later. You could, if you have like a physics problem, you work with accelerometer data, use physics functions like energy, energy rates. And to deal with too many features or too much data, uh, there are a couple of things you can do. You can do dimensionality reduction, which is like maybe you know about principal component analysis, yeah. where you're going to transform a couple of features into one. And, uh, and a simpler thing that we're going to look into is to do feature selection. Select manually or programmatically the features you're going to use in your model. Um, we can also talk about statistical inference, which is about like trying to m drive conclusions by looking at a sample on the overall population. We'll talk a bit more about it later. And we do that to basically improve our model efficiency, whether it's the accuracy, it's the speed, or to save resources. Why are we doing that? So basically it's to, to find hidden information, to uh, find things that we saw in the data analysis that made sense to us, but we want to make it simpler for the model to pick it. So trying to extract the essence of the data, and of course, to improve our training. Yeah, so you can understand that if you have a compact, relevant data set, then your model training is more efficient as opposed to having the whole data set with redundant columns and redundant information without really extracting the essence from it, you're actually overworking your system and you may have limited resources, so you might have to wait longer and you might even get incorrect results because the redundant information might have a, a negative impact on, on, the, on the positive values. So, yeah, let's show us a little bit, Jeremy, how feature engineering yeah. can be done. Let's find out. So here we're going to look at uh, math functions and feature selection. Um, so I come back to um, LSTAT, which is a percentage of lower status in the population uh, in correlation with um, the, the, the target the column, target, the, the, target column, the median yeah. price. Yeah. Uh, so we see there's an interesting nesting trend here. And if we take uh, minus LSTAT, we see that it looks like an exponential curve. 
So in our case, um, we're working with, to start simple, we're starting with uh, linear regression. And um, features engineering should be about uh, you, you start with a simple model and then you iterate uh, and try different experiments with features engineering to see if you can improve the accuracy. And here, one thing which makes it simpler for the model to, 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 to predict the, the price would be just to have a linear correlation as much as possible everywhere. So what we can do is to apply the logarithm function to this column, like I'm doing here, and when I plot the correlation again, I see now that I have a linear uh, trend. So basically you're extracting the trend out of the values and, 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 and bring it to the surface so you can see it and, and validate yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Man. And as I said, it must be part of like an iterative uh, process. So I would train first my model on a baseline on the, on the normal features and try again with that feature transformed. And I see that in that case, I get an, a gain of 4% in accuracy. This is when you tried it out. When you, you created the baseline, then you transformed the, the column, you, you ran the experiment again, yeah. and you compared the baseline with the new results, and then you kept doing this iteratively. Yeah, exactly. Um, then we're going to move to feature section. So uh, it's a small data set. We have only 500 rows and 14 columns. So it's not going to make, bring a lot of much better results to do that, but we find it was an interesting um, step to cover. Yeah. But it is also an interesting step to explore and find out because you can't just drop an idea because you think it may or may not work. It's a good idea to do, try the idea and then not go proceed further with it if you already get the cues that it's not going to work. But always do it and then don't go any further from there if you feel that it's not going to work. Park the results, come back to it later on and, and, and question again. Okay. So in that case, I come back to my correlation matrix that I looked at in the data analysis. Seems to be your favorite correlation <laughs> matrix. <laughs> Beautiful, right? Yeah. Um, so, and here there are many things we might want to do with linear regression is ignore the features which are very highly correlated between themselves because they could cause issues, uh, or um, only pick the columns which have the highest correlation with the target column. And you're going to do this in a manual process, right? You're going to do one after the other, one at exactly. a time, check the results. So it's going to be a bit tedious process. The, what what um, Jeremy also mentioned is important to, to try to identify these features that might actually have a negative impact and that hide away the real results. So this process is really helpful to, to separate the wheat from the chaff, as they say. So in that case, I tried like... Um, uh, you tried one column at a one time, one yeah. column at a time. And, and I found out that the columns which are showing a very minor in improvements, uh, maybe, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but very small, are um, in this age, uh, which are highly correlated with another feature which was, which was this. So I then tried to remove a couple of, um, of those columns, and I found a small uh, gain of less than 1%. That can be explained that Actually, this data set is not so big, and yeah. we As you mentioned don't earlier, like for feature selection to get a, a justice out of certain processes, you need more data, as we already know in general. We need more data to understand the depth of the information. After, you can work on it maybe more programmatically, so there are many ways to do it. You could, for example, use some specific libraries like uh, Grid Search, which is going to try automatically all the features and remove one, them by one, one, uh, one after another by itself. You can also use tree-based selection features, um, to selection models. Is that why you use random forest? Like here. Yeah. So like here, random forest. And random forest, I'm training it on my model. I'm checking, uh, I can check after which columns had the most impact in making the prediction. So one of the good things about the, this regressor, it'll give you a list of the importance it has found in its process, the importance of, of the columns, and it'll give it to you in, in an order of impo highest importance to lowest, and that can all somehow give you some information about what columns really had a positive or higher impact on the target price. And then you can see from the graph here already that uh, we have like mm. almost four contenders on the top, and then if you look This is the bottom, number of room, this is the person of the lower status population, this is criminality. And what we can try from this is like either keep the top features or remove a bottom one. 
And well, here again, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work so well. But that can again, it didn't work well because again we had a smaller data set and we were also experimenting. But there's one thing uh, to notice here is that we did a hypothesis earlier when we were looking at the scatter plot, and we saw actually criminality did not have too much of an impact on the house prices, although random forest tells us something else. So we've got to understand, is it the algorithm that is finding, uh, is it a false positive or is it true positive? Again, don't go with the results just because it's there. Don't go because the numbers look good and, you know, these, these, again, the video on, the, on critical thinking, causality and correlation are not, you know, they're not connected. Okay. Uh, cool. So, um, we did talk about statistical inference. We're not going to cover it. It's a really interesting topic. It's deep, and it's the next step towards uh, if you're going to do more statistics or Bayesian thinking. Is uh, As uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier, it involves um, creating a representative sample data set from a bigger data set and then doing your analysis on that. And uh, that is a lot more uh, effective and efficient than just trying to work on, on a, in a large data set. But we have provided resources to that towards the end of these slides. There's videos and courses and books, and you can have a look at it at your own pace. Cool. So that brings us, we, we always have questions to ask at every stage. So what are the questions you will ask when you're at the feature engineering stage? Like one of the most important questions you want to ask is, um, from what I have found out so far, is my goal achievable? Is the model that I want to create achievable? And am I going to get the results I'm seeking for? Because it's better to ask this question now than to like create the model, do the training, sorry, do the training, create the model, and then hit your head on the wall and trying to get like the 100% that we were trying to do earlier during the skit. Um, uh, also, feature engineering is a rinse and repeat iterative process because as, as Jeremy was pointing out, he did the baseline, he did the experiments, and he goes back and creates another baseline. He does more and more experiments, and then he st sticks around there for quite some time till he's happy that these are the best set of feature engineered uh, columns. And so it's important to know, am I picking up uh, enough cues in each of my iterations? Am I, am I picking up the, the information from ed every step and retrospecting? Uh, and should I be doing that? And how do I do that? Um, and is this process going to help me in crea creating a viable model? By, by the means of a viable model is exactly the opposite of the model we ended up in the first five minutes of this presentation, which is model that works. That you put in a value from the real world, and it gives you the real value, the real answer, right? as opposed to it only works with our training set and a validation set. But when you put in real world values, it gives us the chicken. Was it the chicken or the, or the cat? <laughs> I can't remember anymore. Anyways, um, most importantly are the last two. Are we simplifying the data set at this point? Because if you're working with the same data set or you made it even more complex, then there's a problem there. There's something missing there. Uh, I would look for more simpler data set because there's hidden information in the data set you've been given by whoever's given it to you. And is that data set actually the essence of the original data set? It's highly likely you've, been, you've collected absolutely accurate a data set that is really useful without feature engineering, but then you want to verify that. Uh, and, and the last two points are fairly important when you come all the way to the feature engineering set because those two points will help you with your efficiency and accuracy. So that brings us to the conclusion of this. Um, and Jeremy, you want to tell us more about uh, what others do. So yeah, and, and also why should we, should we, should we Con 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 be con concerned about this because we want to be consistent. We want to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel. That we're doing, we we building something on top of the knowledge of others. Basically, we the, you want to build up on the good work done by other people who've been through this path, who are experienced, who laid out the ground stone, who know the fundamentals, and you learn from that and you build up on top of that rather than trying to reinvent the wheel because this is a massive, huge topic, a, a huge area, and, and you could be led into the unknown. Mm. So, and our presentation so far is an example of the methodologies which are out there. If we can show in the next slides, yeah. we haven't invented anything. Uh, you can see those things uh, in methodologies and framework which has been there for more than 20 years in data mining or the knowledge discovery from data framework. In the next slides, we have like a gra uh, so th this is a semantic representation that. of what we showed so far in the last 40 odd minutes. Uh, I mean, you will agree with me that we've gone through all the steps. It's not literally the same, but semantically we've followed the same steps. And these are the steps that are based on the principles of KDD. 
Um, and you will see it's at the bottom of the slides, and this is going to basically give you a better insight of how you want to go further from here. Um, so there's a motto and a purpose that comes out of this, uh, the motto being know your, knowing your data is important because garbage in is garbage out. And most importantly, we forget is the model is actually the outcome or the reflection and is dependent on the quality of the data you put in and the methodology you use to create the model. Nothing else. The model just doesn't appear from thin air. So we put together all the slides of all the questions to ask here, so you can look at them at your own pace. And so you know at every stage we ask questions, and we also want to critically think and understand. And these are just guidelines, but you want to come up with your own questions. You want to come up with your own answers. And you can use these questions to come up with more questions rather than take them as it is. Uh, we also couldn't fit everything into this talk, and so there are a lot of things that are on the borderline, and so we put this section called peri periphery so that you can look at them at your own pace, but you know, maybe may or may not make sense in this, in the, under this topic. Um, and we put together a whole lot of additional uh, resources. There's two pages full of them, links to notebooks, links to other GitHub repos, um, and courses, yeah. books, and best practices. Um, and yeah, there's this nice template that I found, understanding data science problems. It's also all the questions you want to ask. Um, so here and uh, <laughs> come back to us, actually, after the talk to know more about the um, ML study group, because Jeremy and I can tell you a little bit more about it. We, we meet weekly. Um, and that's it. With that, we want to thank you uh, for your time. And if you have any feedback, that will really benefit the next session we run and will also benefit us, because we'll put it back into the slides and uh, you know, improve the content that's out there. Thank you.